of treatment in various conditions. Let's hear from our expert panel tips and tricks to manage this tricky condition in the OPD. All the faculty <coughs> is experienced towards from our field and need no further introduction. So without wasting further time, we will hear it from them. I congratulate and appreciate the effort of convener Dr. Narayan Karne, moderator Dr. Ashok Ghodke, and our coordinator. Dr. Ashish Pandis and Abhijit Kale. Bijlani for their support. Thank you, everyone. Abhijit. Now, who is our first speaker? Dr. Amulya Singh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm starting. Uh, Dr. Amulya Singh is our first speaker, and he's going to speak on how to improve the patience of the patient waiting in the waiting room of the OPD. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I'm really sorry that my video has some problems. So you have to bear with me, but audio is going on well, hopefully. Uh, and I'm thankful to the Maharashtra Orthopedic Association for giving me a chance. I came from Bombay today only at around 3 p.m. And I will be talking on this, improving the patience of patients in our OPD area. Generally, we all practitioners, whether it is only uh, not only orthopedics, but any department, whenever we are practicing, our patients who are sitting in the waiting area, they are dissatisfied. Then I will come in, what is patience? Patience is actively waiting without complaint and grievances. This is not passively waiting. That is laziness because those patients are not eager to meet us. And how come is patients informing us that patient is waiting for just the right moment before screwing someone over? Means once the patients of our patients get above the threshold level, they are ready to fight with us. This patience is derived from a Latin word pati, which literally means to suffer, to bear, to endure. And no wonder the Indian husbands are referred to as pati dev, which are a pati. How we feel when we are impatient? Yes, we are irritated, ignored, anxious, tensed, nervous, burned out. We are frustrated, stressed, and depressed. The charm, positivity, excitement is lost. And ultimately, we lose our tempers. This is happening in our OPD area. While sitting inside the chamber, we may not realize it, but similar is the feeling of our suffering patients. For consultation, patient has to go to different places in the hospital. Even in my hospital, which is only 75 bedded hospital, once he arrives at the OPD, he has to go to the reception, registration area. Then there are issue of token number. He has to sit on the waiting room before coming and meeting me as a doctor. Issuance of medical prescription, what I do right. Then he has to go to the labs, X-ray room. Somebody has to be there for counseling. Then he goes to the medical pharmacy, collects the medicine, and then goes back. This is a long, long travel for our patients. So patient may lose patients at all the places. So patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. This was said by Joyce Mayer. And we as a clinician have to realize how to improve our patience of our patient. Hospital management does not realize the problems faced by the patient. What the management wants, that patient should sit quietly and wait without expressing anxiety, tension, or frustration. 
Patient should be always calm and considerate. They should not talk or shout in the OPD area. This is what management wants, but something different towards our patient. Negative consequences of being impatient. What is happening? Patient attendants get upset, easily lose temper. They ignore all the good work of the past. So they start shouting. Staff and other patients get disturbed. Inside the chamber, the doctors get disturbed when they use, they hear all those noise outside the chamber. There's further delay and confusion and everybody is suffering now. The quality of care suffers leading to bad reputation of our hospital. To lose patient is to lose the battle, what was said by Mahatma Gandhi. So generally if our patients, patients are losing their patients, we are getting the bad word from the society. Overall perception, what is happening? If generally what is said in the blue line is poor is 6%, but 60% are in good area. So if the patient perception is that 6% that's poor, or maybe only 18% which is satisfactory, more than 6% of poor perception sends a bad impression of hospitals. So mind my words, if six patients out of 100 are not satisfied, that is giving a bad image in our society. Find the problem. Sometimes it is hard to pinpoint exactly from our daily reschedule, it's creating problems to our patient and sending poor perception in society. So design a survey to identify your problems. Being clinician also, you have to come as a good management expert so that you can find out where is the problem. What is happening? What is the reported data of complaints when patients are getting impatient? Generally in OPD environment, what you say, 60% time females are getting impatient and 40% time males are getting in, uh, impatient. In reception and welcome, again, the female area perception is more of getting impatient. So we have to make a comfort at waiting area because our female patients want a comfortable environment. This is very important. And waiting time, it is more than 30 minutes. Then generally the ego of the male comes over and they are getting more impatient. The most important reason for losing patient in OPD area is the increased waiting time where the patients are waiting. Waiting time refers to the patient before a patient waits in the clinic before being seen by the doctor. Means from the registration to final consultation. Patient clinic waiting time is an important indicator of quality of services offered by our hospital. Long waiting time leads to frustration and people get angry. What happened in my clinic two years back? This was being recorded in my CCTV and what is this patient was waiting for more than one hour. Now he comes to the reception area, starts shouting. Yes, he is not happy because he's waiting there for more than one hour now. The staff sister tries to, tries to convince him that the doctor is going to see you after some time. But even this, other patients are till now they are sitting, but down. now see, this percent is increasing. Somebody else is shouting. One patient dissatisfaction leading to more dissatisfaction. Other patients, now they are ready to rise. They are ready to shout. More number are joining. So the solution is to reduce the waiting time. Make sure the patient receives the right care at the right time. Be patient. Some things take time. In turn, this will improve patient perception and reduce the cost of care. So reduce the patient time, you will have more faith among your patients. Why patients fail? Because there is a gap between expectation and performance. Expectation of our patients and performance from our side as a clinician and as a management. So there is a small difference, delight. If you are able to fill this gap, then this is called delight and the patient is never impatient. So fill this gap between your expectation and performance. The Institute of Medicine recommends that at least 90% of patients should be seen within 30 minutes of the scheduled appointment time. If you are given an appointment of 10 a.m., make it sure you see it before 10.30 a.m. at least. Several studies have shown that patients spend two to four hours in the OPD before being seen by the doctor. And this is the most important reason for impatience and creates a poor perception of the hospital. We should try to get a balance between the demand and supply of appointments 
doctors can take advantage of web-based technology like an online check-in system that allows patients to wait for an appointment at a location of their choice. This is very important in this busy world. So e-patient portal can be designed, can be used to reduce the patient wait time. Patients have the opportunity to submit all the information beforehand, but make it very, very simple so the patient is able to fill it properly before he comes to your hospital. Encourage your patient to schedule the appointment for the early morning slot. This is very important. Why? Just like the first flight are usually on time, the morning appointments of the day are usually on time. Support staff behavior. This is very important because most of the time, our patients are surrounded by our staff. All staff should be decent, well-mannered, caring, and supportive to the patient concern. Have dedicated staff for, for easy responsibility, and this will avoid unnecessary confusion among your patients. Front office staff members are our first impression in the hospital and sometimes final impression. If the patient is not satisfied there, he may not come to your chamber. They reflect our professionalism, but request your reception area staff to be away from smartphones during office time. When our patients are waiting, they see their staff working with the social media, they get more angry. Make sure that the duty staffs report at least 30 minutes before the first appointment to avoid confusion. It should not be there that the patients are there, but the staffs are not present on duty. List of appointment along with the tentative reporting should be finalized and duly intimated to the patient doctor. Any last minute changes should be brought to notice as early as possible. If priority is to be given, because especially in Bihar, we have to be surrounded by politicians, press people, and all those bureaucrats, the management should be transparent in this regard. Otherwise, other patients take it in a very bad way. Any delay in an, uh, should be announced by the public address system with due apology and regret from the management side. Many a times, even the doctor should address. Set a time limit for late arrivals. If a patient is more than 30 minutes late, let them know that he has to reschedule the appointment with, same, with some fine. And this is happening everywhere. All organizations like airlines, etc., are implementing this. Then why not the hospitals? The first impression of the hospital, our reception inquiry should be near the entrance. The OPD should be readily accessible. Signage should be displayed at strategic locations so that patients can know where they have to go in the local language. Washroom should be predominantly displayed and should be very, very clean like a five-star hotel. Waiting area should be large enough to accommodate the patients and attendants, especially in this COVID air time. Proper arrangement for lighting and ventilation should be there. The waiting area should display general information of public interest so that patient can get involved and somebody should be there for counseling them within minutes of their waiting time. Waiting area should be very comfortable with adequate facilities like TV, newspaper, Wi-Fi zone. This is very much required this, these days. A large aquarium with attractive fishes. This attracts children. Arrange, arrangement or refreshment that the patient can have some refreshment there and pure drinking and safe water. Doctor interaction with patient attendant. The patient has waited patiently for so long, maybe more than 30 minutes. Now he may be impatient. Now when he's coming inside your chamber, talk and talk to your patient with smile. This is very important. Unless you don't talk, the patient's anger will not subside. Make a good eye contact. Try to touch him. The human touch matters and this will nullify whatever anger he has. Patient wants to interact with you, not your staff. So try to counsel him. Give your precious but precise time. You may not get the second opportunity if the patient goes unhappy from your chamber. Your body language approach can cut down the impatience of your patient. It has been proved beyond doubt that communication skill of a doctor is more important than his technical skill and knowledge to impress the patient. Even if patient was impatient after a long time, this art of communication, of good, good communication skill from the doctor and human touch can bring back the patience of that patient. So the valuable time of a doctor should be focused on interacting with patients, examining, try implementing a team care model where a clinical assistant takes on some additional documentation tasks before he or she enters your chamber. Each minute is precious. Utilize your time judiciously to satisfy and convince your patient Many a times your counseling staffs are there, our sweet and short interaction with patients and the attendants may not satisfy. So have a good counseling staff which can counsel your and satisfy your patient. Have a good team of trained, polite and humble counseling staff who are ready to solve the remaining queries because you cannot be there for long with your patients. 
Patients can come for opinion by our marketing efforts, but retaining them as permanent patient is a big art. For this, reduce the impatience of your patient. And how can you succeed? Satisfying all patients and removing their impatience be an impossible goal for now, but cutting them down is always possible. Remember that lots of patients are bad signal which brings bad repute of your practice and there is risk of losing revenue and patient. You have built a big empire. Don't lose your patients because they are getting impatient. So listen carefully, be responsive to their whatever needs, understand the needs expectation of your patient, work on your brand image of your hospital, encourage the patient feedback, measure and try to improve whatever drawbacks were there. Being a successful doctor is more about maintaining patience of our patients than our own skill and knowledge. Care more for the individual patient than for the special feature of the disease. Put yourself in his place. The kind word, the cheerful greeting, the sympathetic look. These the patient understand what William Osler has said. So focusing on patient satisfaction, what you do? Patients will come and go. Some will test you. Some will love you. Some will leave you. Some will bless you. But as a doctor, be patient and bring the solutions so they are always happy with you. So for this, communication skill with of the nurses, communication skill with doctors, communication about medicines, responsiveness of hospital staff, how to properly make management. This is very important. Orthopedic surgeons, clean and quietness of the hospital environment. Discharge instructions should be in detail and overall hospital rating. These all matters for our patient satisfaction as such. So if advantage of patient satisfaction, if the patients are satisfied, they bring good number of patient. This is the total quality management. If one of the patient is not satisfied, they're satisfied that reaches four new patient. But if you disappoint one patient that reaches 10 potential patient, and there's a big loss. A man who is Master of patient is the master of everything else. This was said by Lord Holfin. And we as a doctor have to realize that we have to maintain a good patience of the patient for a very, very successful outcome as a good clinician, good doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Amulya Singh, for that wonderful talk. It is uh, rightly said that if you don't have patience, you will lose patience. And if you don't have patience, Again, you will lose patients. So patients and patients goes hand in hand. And Dr. Amulya Singh has very well informed how one should try to maintain the flow of patients and also have patients while dealing with these patients. Any, uh, any questions for Dr. Amulya Singh from the panel members? Fine. I have one question, Dr. Amulya Singh, for you. Yes. Yes, sir. So according to you, what is the common cause because of which patient or the relatives lose their patients while waiting in the waiting room? So, uh, what I told you, whenever the patient is coming, especially in our orthopedic practice, uh, they are surrounded by either uh, the family members, maybe husband with the wife, wife with the husband or the children. And generally, the patient is in agony because of the pain or whatever may be the clinical scenario. So you have to be very concise and your staff who is sitting on the outside in the reception area, they should start behaving and talking properly with the patients because whatever time they are getting outside as a waiting time, they are actually mentally getting exhausted. So approach should start right from that place. So a good experienced staff should be outside trying to counsel them. If there is an emergency, try to shift to your emergency room just have a look and try to talk to whoever attendant is there. Once the attendant meets you, their patients is in a good shape and they are ready to wait for you for some more time. So try to talk at least for some time before they are getting impatient. True, sir. Sir, another point you emphasized very well was the, the person who is at the front desk or the receptionist is the first and the last impression about your clinic. Yes, that sir. That point was is very well taken, sir. Thank yes, you sir. for that wonderful talk. Thank you, we sir. We move over to the next part of the scientific program, which is on sodium channel blockers and the other physiological portals for managing the pain.
and to emphasize on this uh, we Okay, okay. Good afternoon, friends. I think Doc Chinde's uh, audio has slight break, so it's my chance. And uh, as I have been allotted an hour, I will con uh, conclude in 15 minutes. It's a huge, large topic, and I will rush through it. Very fortunately, we have Dr. Arvind Devakar Jain with us, who is also, the gentleman who has uh, uh, co-invented this with us. And so, here we have a talk at a start. Let me first thank by thanking the West Zone Orthopedics Association, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Gujarat Orthopedic Association, their office bearers for giving me an opportunity to present our talk. And I thank the office bearers of Indian Orthopedic Association, Dr. Ramesh Sen, Atul Shivastav, Ram Chadda, Navin Dakar, Maharashtra Orthopedic Association, Dr. Ajit Sinde, West Zone Orthopedic Association, Dr. Ajit Sinde, Vikas Jain, and Shivan and the Mandarkar, and of course, Dr. Gaji Godavone, Govind Purohe, Kamlesh Devamurli, Deva Murari, and finally, my very, very close friend, Dr. Narayan Karne, for having given me this opportunity. I call this new vistas in pain management. This has been with us for now close to four years. It's now been used in uh, at least 16 to 18 countries by over 600 practitioners, including doctors, anesthetists, pain management specialists, neurosurgeons, and others. As this audience is consisting of a wide range of viewers with either no knowledge about these blocks or many who actually done the course and are practicing this regularly, I will try to strike a balance by not being too basic nor being too advanced. Before we start this talk, I'd like to show you some small video clips that show you what exactly these portal injections can do. So let us start with a clip of a patient which has been sent to me from South Africa by my friend, Dr. Rodrigo. This patient is from Peru, Lima, with acute spondylolisthesis, severe sciatica, was bedridden, was on traction, her straight leg raise on one side was about 20 degrees. The straight leg raise on the other side was 15 degrees. She was in acute agony. She has been given beta 1, 2, and 3 blocks on both sides. And there she raises a thumb, showing that the blocks have benefited her. The one who needed two people to make her get on the couch, immediately after injection, is able to walk on her own within 10 minutes, there slowly she improved her speed and strength and tempo. Her smile widens as her pain disappears. And there you can look at the face expressions and realize how happy she is. And a patient who came in a wheelchair walks out dancing. Another patient who had a very stiff shoulder was advised arthroscopic repair of the rotator cuff immediately after injection without any physiotherapy. So, some moments. A patient from Pakistan that is pre injection status, that is opposite hand, and is telling that the type of pain he had. And we can see now how beautifully he is raising his hand after the injection. 
and he's finding out the spot where he was injected and how his pain disappeared. This is another interesting case, patient. This is not a clinic or a hospital. This is my own house, my drawing room. This is my butcher who brings mutton for my dogs. Very severe back pain and very severe hamstring spasm. You need two people to allow him to walk. You're practically carried into my drawing room. And I have given him beta 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 blocks. Beta 5 block is given in the calf, 4 centimeters below the popliteal crease. Here he is immediately after the block. You can see him at least independently walking, though limping. In 10 minutes, he started walking into the garden. The same evening when he came to deliver the mutton to me, we can see him. How happy he is. He has squatted, got up. His pain disappeared. This was injected three years ago. And to date, he has had no more problems. This is not a course. The talk is being attended by both sets of people who are both ignorant and who know about this very well. So let us do some definitions. Physiological pain portals are the correct spots to inject the medications which will cause dramatic relief in the pain. The medications injected are called the sodium channel blockers, about which detailed explanations will be given later in the lecture. The blocks are effective in a plethora of conditions, from frozen shoulder to herpes zoster, to even pain due to acute myocardial infarction. You can see a patient of herpes zoster, and see how fulminant the herpes is. And within three days after a block, the blisters have gone, the neurotic pain has gone. This case is Dr. Devakar's case, and I am thankful to him for this. The next one, I don't want to have dual talk because that video already had a talk. This is my cousin who came here. Talk video will demonstrate a game changer in back pain, spondylolisthesis, and sciatica. The patient is my relative, and I gave her double four B portal, and which is a revolutionary portal at the sacroiliac joint, given on both sides, on either side of the midline, effective within 10 minutes and last for many days. The second portal, this portal is useful. So I have to way, so I have to dislocate the hip, low back pain without radicalizing. And the next portal is Bure portal. The level is two centimeters in front and lateral to the anterior inferior border of the lateral manula. And this is a neurogenic portal. So we can combine beta one and tau four portals. This patient, my cousin's daughter, came to my house, has a very restricted SLR. This is grade 3 by 4, was in great distress and anguish, and came crying because she was advised surgery by three surgeons. She flew all the way to Palakka to my house, and she was complaining and showing her X-rays and scans and explaining. I have cleaned. The portal spots on Gore portal site and the sacroiliac joint. The patient is extremely apprehensive. I have mixed 0.5 percent lignocaine with 30 milligrams nonadine. Here, my first jab is on one side of sacroiliac joint, second side of sacroiliac joint. These are tau or trunk portal four. Subsequently, I am going to inject the gore portals, which are the ankle. And these portals are inferior to an anterior to the lateral malleolus. Injection is not at right angle. And we go a little below. So, potential tissue, once 
these portals are done, the patient is able to dramatically lift her leg. Her SLR was so restricted, her back was so stiff before treatment that she cannot believe how happy she is. I asked her to sit up, I asked her to turn around, I asked her to shift her back, looking at me, and she says, in 20 minutes, my relief is so dramatic. I am 100% relieved. Within an hour, my cousin's daughter was laughing. She not only recorded my video for my Miras class, but also proved to me that DSCD is a game changer in orthopedics and an extremely useful procedure. So how do we classify and name these portals? The nomenclature was worked out between Dr. Divakar and myself based on Greek alphabets, as Dr. Divakar is very keen and a lover of Latin and Greek. When the portals were first described, they were primarily used for sciatica and disc related issues based on Dr. Divakar and Dr. Gore's work. Later on, Dr. Divakar and myself experimented with these and discovered many, many more spots for a wide variety of conditions, so much so that today we have about 36 points of injection with specific effects. These days, we classify them as distal sodium channel blocks, proximal sodium channel blocks, and miscellaneous sodium channel blocks. It is to be very clearly understood the same portal may work both for DSCB and PSCB depending on the condition. So the injection point may be proximal or distal to the site of the problem. And so the original terminology called DSCB has been abandoned and we just call them physiological pain portals. It has become clear now that the classification of sodium channel blocks is based on the condition for which it is used. Why the physiological pain portals are the actual spot for administration of these drugs. What is injected? This is very, very important. You can take photographs of these slides. Or anyway, these are on the YouTube, so you can see them as many times as you want. The composition for cocktail for neurological conditions will be 3 ml of 2% lidocaine, 30 mg of clonidine, 20 mg of dipomedorol, 6 ml of water, making 10 ml enough for 4 portals, 10 ml enough for 6 to 8 portals of 1 ml or 4 portals of 2.5 ml, essential constituent being 0.5% xylocaine as the chief sodium channel blocker. We do not use steroids in cocktail for fractures. And as the talk goes on, I will be showing examples and telling you what is the role of these portals in fracture management as well. At the time of making of these slides, 32 portals were uh, described. Four more newer portals have been invented, which shall be added shortly. No single person can take credit for invention of these portals. Dr. Divakar and Dr. Gore were the pioneers who invented the initial portals. I have been associated with a few more portals after that. And after this, there has been one Dr. Dayanidhi Jaiswara. And then around 12 other orthopedic surgeons from different parts of the country collaborated with us and invented other portals. We have been meticulous in giving the names of the discoverers of specific portals in the book. The upper limb portals are called alpha portals, ranging from alpha 1 to alpha 7 now and include many subportals. The lower limb portals are called beta portals and range from beta 1 to beta 6 and include many subportals. Now beta 7 portal is there. Trunk portals are called tau and they range from tau 1 to tau 8. Head and neck portals are called kappa portals and currently k 1, 2 and 3. Alpha 1 portal is given in the first web space and that is the first web space where we can see the spot of injection between the thumb and index finger. 
This is described as a classic Devakar portal. First described by him in 2015. It is useful for many conditions, both traumatic and non-traumatic. The thumb is spread wide and the injection is administered in the web. And this is primarily indicated for periarthritis of shoulder, supraspinal tendinitis, rotator cuff, shoulder dislocation, fracture clavicle, elbow dislocation, supracondylar fracture, fracture head and neck of radius, intracondylar fracture, distal radius, cervical brachialgia, and tennis elbow. Ball for elbow, pseudoacatrophy, acromioclavicular joint injuries, and lateral complex, lateral clavicular fracture complex. Very important to know that. This does not work in humerus shaft fractures. This is a separate portal for humerus shaft fractures. Here we can have a clear audio of the patient and you can understand how much it helps him. This patient is from Peshawar, Pakistan. I hope you can hear his voice. No, no, no. زبردست ڈیڑھ لگا this one is a patient from Kerala during COVID times and this is the immediate post injection. I have misplaced the pre injection X-ray uh, moments where she was hardly able to move her shoulders, extremely stiff, and that was how it was coming. And immediately post injection, you can see how beautifully she is moving her hand. سامنے ہاتھ کریے ابھی کہاں درد ہوتا ہے جتنا جاتا ہے اسے آرام سے آپ لے کے جائیے زبردستی مت کر دیے لے جائیے لے جائیے نیچے کر لیجیے دلی دلی سو ون کین آلویز کلیم وتھ سرٹینٹی دیٹ الفا ون بلاک از اے بلاک دیٹ ورکس دس بلاک آلویز ورکس اینڈ ایٹ پروڈیوس ڈرامیٹک ریزلٹس Right now, our paper is being considered for publication by Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and its under division. And that will be a landmark paper with over 8,000 patients with 90% satisfaction. Alpha has supporters, they are called Alpha 1, A, B, and C. And these are the second, third, and fourth web spaces. We ask the patient to spread the finger and then Inject in alpha 1A, 1B, 1C, and 1D. In the case of a Collis fracture, where we are giving an alpha 1 injection, the injection patients are different. I'm just showing you the spots that are being given. 
because that quality fracture which was reduced in the theater we had done the alpha 1a bnc injections in the uh, preparation room whereas we are giving the hematoma block in the operation theater and as usual classical nephrotic deformity standard reduction and as taught by shanley the surgeon holds and the assistant plasters alpha 2 portal is beneath the deep fascia in the carpal tunnel a volume of 2 to 3 ml is given the duration is 15 to 20 minutes this is a very very definitive and useful portal for crps sudex atrophy and has to be repeated every 7 days along with medical management we do not use steroids for this portal because these portals have to be repeated frequently every 5 to 7 days but it is a dramatic portal for sudex atrophy where we can see the radiological changes in 15 days that is alpha 2 portal or a carpal tunnel portal alpha 3 and alpha 4 are elbow portals alpha 3 is about the medial epicondyle and alpha 4 is around the lateral epicondyle these together are called the tennis elbow and golfer's elbow portals and are adjoint portals alpha 3 and 4 to alpha 1 so depending on whether it is a tennis elbow or a golfer's elbow you use either alpha 3 or alpha 4 or alpha 1 and for all cervical spine injuries you use alpha 1 2 3 and 4 portals as i'll be explaining later alpha 5 is the an insertion of deltoid it is given very carefully to avoid the radial nerve you have to go obliquely hit the humeral shaft of the deltoid insertion withdraw few millimeters and then inject if the patient says that he feels some tingling or numbness the needle has to be drawn out of the skin and reinserted because we do not want to inject into the radial nerve this is very standard very much like a standard intramuscular injection and this is the alpha 5 and delta 4 portal in combination for with alpha 6 portal or the scalene portal this is extremely useful for fracture shaft of humerus also alpha 6 is the inferior border of the scalenius anterior just above the clavicle and this gives a very dramatic pain relief for fracture shaft of humerus 3 to 5 ml is given and this is excellent for close manipulation extension casting plaster applications and for shifting the patient for x ray to take proper ap and lateral views which may not be normally possible due to the extreme pain of the bone grating which a patient has so alpha 5 and alpha 6 blocks together should be given before we try to manipulate the humerus or even send the patient to x the combination of alpha portals and adjoint portals is excellent for torticollis right neck cervical brachialgia and is also the sole portal for dramatic pain of humerus we can see a few cases of fracture proximal humerus created only by alpha 1 and alpha 7 blocks where we do not immobilize there is no strapping there is no sling there is no filos anyway we just inject and start the patient pendulum from day 1 and wall crawling from day 3 with a complete disregard to the fracture pattern and all of them end up uniting beautifully in as little as 4 to 5 weeks scarless metal free and you can see the full function of the patient here the patient surgeon has given a sling 
we normally do not give a sling or arm pouch. You can see the fractures. Such fractures do not need any metal whatsoever. Alpha 1, alpha 5, alpha 6 blocks are the definitive management which will allow the patient to do this extent of movement in 21 days. There is a radiological union in 4 to 5 weeks. So, and the patient is functionally normal. We call the alpha blocks as the philos killers because properly followed, I assure you that in the next few years, these blocks will totally kill philos and will cause a great anguish to the dedicated AO shoulder surgeons whose bread and butter is lost. An excellent example, this was a jockey, horse jockey from uh, South America. She had to compete in a race and she fell down from her horse, broke the lateral end of her clavicle and had an extraordinary clavicle disruption. Very fortunately, the whole thing was videographed and we could get the video clippings of the girl falling from the horse and how her clavicle is being broken and that is a doctor giving an alpha 1 block and that is a patient, we can see her movements immediately after the block. This is 7 hours or 6 hours after the fracture when she fell down from a horse and she wanted to do horse riding on the next day because that was the gold medal competition. So imagine having a fracture lateral end of the clavicle with an acromial clavicular disruption, reaching the doctor within five to six hours of the fracture, getting an injection in the first web space, regaining full shoulder function and competing the next day in a competitive horse racing and getting a bronze medal. So she had hope for the gold, but because of injury, she got a bronze. But thanks to just 0.5 ml allocane and 30 milligram of clonidine, she could win a horse race. So, sorry, we are now back to, we are now on to the lower limb portals or beta portals. Beta 1 is situated anterior and inferior to lateral manulas. This is originally described by Gore and this was the forerunner of the terminology DSCB blocks. He initially described it as a Gore test where he said that pressure on this point will cause tingling and numbness to the patient and injection of plain zalogen on this point will cause temporary relief to distinguish between surgical and non-surgical patients. But since we have discovered this, this has avoided over 5,000 backs from surgery. And uh, alone or in combination, this is one of the most effective blocks for patients with sciatica and extremely limited SLR. Of the blocks, alpha 1, beta 1 and beta 6 are universal blocks which have helped thousands upon thousands of patients. Beta-1 block has changed the dimensions of spine surgery and surgeons participating in the initial coding channel study and course have reported an incidence reduction of 80% in surgical indications of spine surgery after these blocks were introduced. This is a purely neurological block and has no space in trauma. A combination of beta-1, 2 and 3 is the most commonly used mixture for all spinal issues with or without sciatica. For back cases without sciatica, tau portals are needed in addition, and these are described subsequently. For Miralgia parasitica, this is an adjoint portal. For pseudo atrophy of foot, also this is an adjoint portal. Beta 1 is also useful for claw foot and claw throws, and foot drop to spinal issues. EHL weakness due to spinal issues and muscular dystrophies in combination with other portals. That is the classic beta-1 portal, inferior and anterior to the lateral malleolus. 
beta 1 a b c d portals are adjoint portals and they are very similar to the alpha 1 a b c these are given in the interdistal areas between the first and second second and third third and fourth and fourth and fifth and as the space is small we are only able to give half to 1 cc and these are adjoint portals to beta 1 portal. Beta 2 is behind the lateral malleolus between the tendoachylator and the posterior inferior part of the lateral malleolus. That should be the sural cluster and that is beta 2 block. Beta 2a is very important portal administered from the fourth and fifth metatarsals in the intracheous space. This portal was described by Dr. Dayanadi Jaiswara and is a very useful portal in pain to refract your spine, spinous process osteoporotic wedge compression fracture, simple traumatic spinal fractures, and in painful osteoporotic back aches of elderly women not responding to any anti-inflammatories. That is beta 2a portal, works beautifully in back aches. B3 is administered behind middle manulus, contract contralateral to B2 portal, and uh, here, we are showing a few examples of patients who are responding to various portal block injections. And apart from my cases, we are cases all over the country and abroad clearly displaying to you that this is not a procedure, but a reproducible procedure which will work in any hand. This is a non commercial therapeutic modality where no company is promoted, no specific drug is promoted. No plates or tools or any specific manufacture of an implant is injected, but the patient is able to get dramatic relief with a very, very low cost to the surgeon and very, very high benefit to the patient. Many of the viewers are interested in doing an online course for three months, learning about the finer points of these portals from Dr. Sivakar and myself, uh, you are requested to note the WhatsApp number the 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 and message me in WhatsApp. I'll do my best to accommodate you. We can see how much this girl has after injections. Is, she had not I don't know if you bandages after injection. Do you have a one more patient, you can see the agony and the pain on his face. Explaining how he has got a pain. So, uh, patients who did not have five to ten degrees of pain. How much time did you take? How much time did you take? So this patient says there is 95% relief in pain, 95% improvement in SLR and 60% improvement in tickling. 
beta 4 is near the fibular head and is adjuvant portal with beta 1, 2, and 3. It is an important portal for osteoarthritis of the knee and usually given in combination beta 5 portal. We have to palpate the fibular head, locate the intraoperative space next to it, and this will take about 3 to 4 ml of uh, our cocktail. Beta 5, I think I already have shown you a video in the initial part that is given the midline into the calf between the two heads of gastronomia, 5 centimeters below the pulmonary decrease. And injection intramuscular level. Beta 5 portal was first described on social media by Dr. Dayani D. Jayaswara. It is an important portal for osteoarthritis and is given in combination with beta 4 portal. Uh, relief in osteoarthritis is beta 5 and 4 is rather short lived. But if you are giving it for rheumatoid arthritis along with low dose DMRDs, they can significantly delay the total knee replacement. Beta 5 portal is a very important portal for determining the feasibility of proximal fibular osteotomy. PFO is a minimally invasive surgery for isolated early middle compartment arthritis. And if beta 5 gives dramatic relief in the knee, irrespective of the radiological appearance, if the relief from beta 5 lasts for more than four calendar days, the patient will benefit from PFO from six months to six years, depending on his good luck. Combination of beta 5 and 5A portals is useful for ankle injuries and quad fracture. And here they act as proximal sodium channel block. These beta 5, 4, 5A blocks have been used in other conditions like myopathies, myasthenia gravis, congenital pseudomuscular hypertrophy. I have videos, but I do not want to show a single case and make it as an example. Beta 5 portal in the calf of the belly is a very useful portal. Beta 5A is in the periosteum and again it's a trauma portal which about which I have described a little earlier. Now we can come to the very, uh, this is an example <laughs> of a sports <laughs> <person> <laughs> She talks about acute symptoms of her hamstrings and she is not able to play properly, she is not able to play properly. And when she was asked to squat, so her knees are tight. ਕਿਰਾਪ exactly <laughs> Right. It is usually no pain actually, and then this patient actually no, stood up and ran, and, uh, and we are approaching 40th minute of my talk. I shall quickly forward because we have a lot more things to convey to you. This is a very important portal, beta 6 portal, just similar to beta 1 portal, beta 6 is one of the most effective portals discovered so far. This is a game changer in trauma management is a proximal and a sodium channel block. Spot is lateral to the femoral neurovascular bundle in the inguinal crease. It is administered sub-inguinal. 4 to 5 ml can be injected. And it is a very effective portal in fact, the shaft of femur, like the neck of femur, trochantric femur, distal femurs. From the top to the bottom of the femur, it is a very, very effective portal. Intracapsular, extracapsular, 
this produces such dramatic and instant pain relief that can be used either as a palliative or a therapeutic block. In surgical management of proximal femurs, we need proper x-rays. But with extreme pain with the patient has, it is impossible to take proper x-rays. Giving beta-6 block in casualty before radiograph makes the procedure very, very easy. Beta-6 portals also emerge as a definitive management of endotrochantic fractures which are stable and valgus impacted. And in subcapital fractures, which are again impacted, the ergonomic policy of block and walk has emerged. Our scientific paper has been published in a prestigious journal, HIP International, just block and walk these fractures. People who are uninitiated to this may not be able to understand how dramatic and how game changing this portal is. And even before applying Thomas splint or shifting to an X ray by just giving a beta six block, makes the patient so dramatically pain free that we get precise and proper radiographs and pain free smiling patient coming out of the X ray room. We all know the fates of trochanteric fractures whether operated or not operated. If you don't operate, they will die in three months. If you operate, 40% is going to die in a year. Look at this fracture. And we can see this patient who is being managed by my brother-in-law. As the video is playing, I will just go and have a short toilet break and come. You can just watch the video. Now you can see that in this trochanteric fracture, within 20 minutes of giving the injection, the patient has stood up and walked with a walker. The physician giving the injection is not an orthopedic surgeon. He is my sister's husband, an MD medicine. The patient came to the hospital in Palakkad. He sent me the x-ray saying that the patient was unwilling for surgery. So I just explained to him on phone what to inject and where to inject. And immediately after the injection, this patient was walking. This patient took only 61 days for a solid union of a trochanteric fracture, walking from day one after the fracture and her beta-6 blocks. She received one block every five days. She stayed in the hospital for five days. After the second block, she was discharged home. Thereafter, they paid our hospital nurse 2,000 rupees for a visit where the nurse would visit their house and give an injection and she would walk. During COVID times, anyway, we were all scared of surgeries and this was a good way to learn a new method of management. You can see day one, day 30, day 80, solid union, no DHS, no PFN. Again, day one, day 30, day 80. You can see the day 80 x-ray of such wonderful union without displacement. Day one, day 91, slight virus, but patient is totally asymptomatic. This is the correct spot where my finger points for beta-6 injection. Another example of a patient from Chennai had this fracture and he is distantly related to me. He met my nurse. Uh, he could not come to Palakkad. So I guided him on the phone. I guided my nurse on the phone. He is explaining that he has got pain and he is not able to move. 
and uh, there she is injecting exactly the spot where we have told just allocane and chlorinine lateral to the femoral neurovascular bundle. This is a real time video without speed ups. The lady who is injecting is my theater nurse, fully seen from Chennai. Immediately after the injection, the patient is made to stand and walk. We all have treated hundreds and thousands of trochanteric fractures and we know how painful these fractures are. Even to shift from the bed to the x-ray department and take a proper lateral view on the x-ray department. Unless a spinal anesthesia is given, you cannot take a lateral view of these hips. That has been the past and that has been the past teaching and that is why these fractures were made as fracture necessitans or fractures of necessity which need compulsory surgery. However, with invention of blocks, the whole geometry has changed, the whole geography has changed and within 20 minutes of injection, the patient walks with a walker pain-free in the clinic itself and this patient, my nurse had to go to his house once a week for about five weeks. He required six injections in total, one in the hospital and five at home. He was fully mobile throughout the course of treatment. This, this is the patient at home walking. He is actually distantly related to me, one of my great grand uncles. He was 87 years old and uh, he is telling that he never believed that he could get his hip cured without surgery as he had consulted six doctors including many in the family who had told them that the hip will telescope and will move in. And here he is united in less than 80 days, 8-0. Another case on day 1 and day 91. Day 1, day 100. I challenge the orthopedic surgeons in the world to show me any series of DHS or PFN with such exotic functional results, scar free, metal free. This was a patient who had a one and a half inch shortening and 20 degrees external rotation. Despite that, the patient was extremely happy because he had seen patients who have been operated and in misery. So, trochanteric fractures are not a fracture of necessity provided you know how to treat them well. You can see again this fracture would have been, if he had been punished by DHS or PFN at the age of 92, it would have been disaster. Block and walk was a magic. The paper has not only been published by Sage International Skip, it has been now cited by over 71 publications and right now 40 different trials all over the world are happening for this procedure. And who knows, in a few years, Campbell may also have a section on non-operative block and walk treatment for fractures. Now we have only 10 minutes, so let us just quickly finish the trunk and uh, head and neck portals. Trunk portals are 80 number, mid-sternal, mid-axillary, supraumbilical, infraumbilical, sacroiliac, transverse process, inferior scapular, superior scapular, anterior superior leg spine. These act both as proximal and distal and they can be called revolution, revolutionary portals because they are used in a large variety of conditions in, including non-orthopedic situations like COVID pneumonia, chronic bronchi obstructive bronchitis, pulmonary disease, status asthmaticus, corona diarrhea, compression fracture ribs, herpes zoster, chest infection, back pain or radiation, spondylolisthesis and failed back syndromes. Tau 1 is a mid circle portal and indicated in single and multiple fractures and chest infection. Dr. Devaka found it was very useful in COVID pneumonia and chest infection, very useful in status asthmatic attacks. Next is in ankylosing spondylosis being treated with pyrile butagone, tau 1 blocks once a week, helps in regaining the chest expansion within three months. 
Short acting block, five to seven days, so need to repeat it. That is mid sternal or tau one. Tau two is a mid axillary block. Strange thing is, it's not relevant which site you give. Any rib fracture, you give it in any spot, the rib fracture becomes pain free. So it may be fifth rib, you give it in mid sternal point and seventh, it's pain free. The seventh rib, you give it in ninth or you give it in fifth, it's still pain free. So one mid sternal block is enough for any rib, single or multiple, and even stowed in chest and paradoxical breathing, it sort of produces a magical relief. It adjoined a T1 and extremely useful in severe asthmatic attacks, including status asthmaticus. Recently on a flight, I had a patient who had an acute MI along with an asthmatic attack, and they were asking for a doctor. And fortunately, I had Zaloke in my hand baggage, so I just gave him alpha 1, tau 1, and tau 2 blocks. And by the time the flight landed, the fellow had forgotten that he had any problems. Anyway, I insisted him to meet a cardiac physician and get his uh, uh, investigation done, lest he gets an attack later in the night and dies. All these blocks are short active, short active, five to seven days, and underlying condition has to be treated. Shown earlier, these are excellent blocks for herpes. Fulminant herpes doctor. Just by roster, uh, just by the trunk blocks, not only does the inflammation heal, but the patient is very free of the painful neurologic conditions by with which he or she was suffering for such a long time. Tau 3 and IE portals, the supra and from umbilical portals, they are given intramuscular without getting into the abdominal or peritoneum. Above the umbilicus, below the umbilicus, as shown in the photograph. They are called the physician's portal or surgeon's portal. Indicated in pediatric gastroenteritis, constipation, systemic viral illness, mesenteric lymphadenitis, infantile colic, viral gastroenteritis, including COVID gastritis, ureteric colic, dysmenorrhea, cramps, severe gastritis, abdominal pains, menstrual cramps, and colic associated with irritable bowel syndrome. And of course, acute abdomen, including appendicitis, as an urgent pain management in the casualty before the patient is shifted for scan or other diagnosis. Of course, this is an excellent method for terminal palliative management of malignancies, multiple secondaries, and opiate dependent patients in whom blocks reduce or eliminate the need for narcotic or non narcotic analgesics. Three orthopedic surgeons, mothers with multiple secondaries of uh, uterine cancer, have lived their ends peacefully with these tau 3 and 4 blocks. But we must understand here very, very carefully that these portals produce dramatic relief of pain, but does not cure a condition, do nothing to the underlying pathology. So it is essential to find out the root cause and of course administer it by chemo or radio or whatever. So in self-limiting in our first conditions, portals alone are enough. Otherwise, they require management by medical or surgical means. That is 3A and 3B. Tau 4, I have shown you the sacrolytic portals much earlier. They are on the left and right side of the sacrolytic joint. And they are, they are adjoint portals for disc and back conditions. And uh, we usually use Tau 4 and Beta 6 portal for pain relief and renal colleagues and pelvic injuries. That is Tau 4. There's a small video, oh, but I think baby. I'm going to skip this video because we are approaching my closing of time. I have shown you enough videos. Tau 5s are transverse process portals. The spinous process is palpated and one traces the transverse process on either side. And the injection is given at the intermuscular level, close to the transverse process. And injection is given about one centimeter deep. They are very much indicated in compression fractures of vertebra, transverse fractures and process fractures. Non specific backache, no shatika in combination with other blocks, renal colic, fatigue backaches. So these are the spots. You can give them at any transfer process. And in combination with beta 1, 2, and 3, the extremely beautiful blocks for uh, back pain. Here is a simple example of tau 5, 4, 4 5 blocks. 
how the patient is coming chalo chalo bhai ji chalo koi baat hai mara hu bhai sorry i have anyway i think i think i leave this to so aap apne ko dena we can we have 5 minutes let us show this video wheelchair bound patients enter the hospital unable to walk chalo and chalo bhai ji chalo aap just koi baat hai mara hu bhai chalo they walk home unaided and assisted unable to believe that such miracles can happen or have happened to them ab kamar mein bhi ho raha hai pairon mein bhi ho raha hai piche ki taraf और पैरों में आ रही है पैरों में भी आ रही है एनीवे आई थिंक वी कैन आई विल फॉरवर्ड द वीडियो यू कैन इमेजिन दिस पेशेंट डिड ब्यूटीफुली एंड ही डिड वेल दैट ही इज आई थिंक पोस्ट सर्जरी इज वॉकिंग विद हर हस्बैंड अदर विद द पर्सन विद द सन एंड देन आफ्टर द फाइनली शी वॉक नाइटली नाउ टाउ 6 ए एंड बी आर सुप्रा इंफ्रा स्कैपुलर पोर्टल्स एंड दे आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर राइट नेक नेक्स्ट स्टिफनेस and in the combination of kappa portal is very uh, useful for cervical spondylosis and radiculopathies a very interesting case this patient had a, a fracture of c2 vertebra with pseudo paralysis of the upper limb stable fracture which we tested under uh, cm and if you can see this uh, patient he had i can run this fast that is the patient and we we have pre injection status here zero moments despite best effort that is the same pre 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 moments and immediately post you can see no moments asa 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 kar asa kar this man was again a very surgery man very surgeon but uh, he is now doing very normally and well tau 6 b and a are supra and infra scapular portals and they are again injected at the corner in all traumatic conditions these locks are used as either as emergency pain relief or part of definitive pain management last is asis portal which is a combination with beta 6 portal now just three more portals left they are skull k1 k2 and k3 K1 is a bindi portal, which is a mid forehead portal. K2 is a temporal portal, which is above the ear, and K3 is an occipital portal, which is in the occiput. All of these three portals are meant for headache, right neck, torticollis, tension headache. and cervical brachialgia so now within one minute i'll quickly run through all the portals that is alpha 1 alpha 1 a b and c alpha 2 alpha 3 alpha 4 alpha 5 and 6 beta 1 1 a b c beta 2 beta 3 ho gaya pehle beta 3 is done beta 4 and beta 5 this is beta 5 mid calf This is beta five a mid-shin, beta six inguinal, beta seven uh, tau a. Uh, th this is tau a mid-sternal, tau b intercostal, tau three a and b supra and from lateral, tau four sacroiliac, tau five transverse process, tau six a and b supra and infrascapular portals. tau 7 asis portal kappa 1 mid forehead portal kappa 2 temporal portal kappa 3 occipital portal you can see a disc how badly degenerated it is and how it is prolapsing and how after injection this patient that was his first walk that was his second walk and that was his final walk so that is how good these portals are so let me conclude match the disease with appropriate portals these are not panacea for all ills but basically revolutionary and effective pain management methodologies 
treatment is complementary and the blocks are essential only for pain management you cannot treat a malignancy with these blocks alone you must be well aware of red flags secondary malignancies tuberculosis here scp works as inexpensive and effective pain management methodology only in most trauma cases blocks are either supplemental to surgical management or in our modern ergonomic method sole treatment of fractures elected to be treated non operatively and ergonomically even in fractures treated by plaster mobilization blocks make the patient get back to function earlier important considerations they are non anesthetic blocks anesthesia has taken a side effect or a wrong side feel free to experiment from wherever the effect comes to the correct side so apart from these 38 sites if you can invent 10 more sites please communicate with them and we will add avoid tight spaces like intratendinous intravital superiorsia resistance means bad site not applicable to beta 4 and 5 alone familiarize yourself with anatomy landmarks keep meticulous records learn as you use the procedure and remember that the patient is the best teacher an apoplectic reaction is very rare most often happens with allocane which has preservatives cardiac xylocard dot preservative is safe but whole while must be discarded in the same day the solution on the same day else the solution develops a fungal infection treat blocks as major procedure take all self precautions and keep adrenaline oxygen handy in case you land in trouble not all your professional colleagues may be aware of this revolutionary new methodology you may face opposition and ridicule be prepared for that because your patient satisfaction is a reward when i started the work everybody made fun of me however now it is recognized nationally and internationally and the book has been translated into five languages please remember the proper dilution is the key and 0.5 percent allocane gives a better effect than 2 percent with less risk in any fracture or trauma situation it is essential to administer blocks as you make your visual and heuristic diagnosis only then should you proceed towards patient examination or send a patient for x-rays this makes positioning and radiography much easier for the radiographer and much less irksome and painful for the patient a block has drugs of less toxicity than a single diclofenac injection or a paracetamol infusion so do not hesitate to repeat them often please remember use steroid in cocktail only the first time thereafter use only xylocaine and chloridine if needed portals remember them correctly inject in the correct spot for consistent and good results thank you very very much for patient listening and i think i could exactly complete it in 59 minutes so i can stop my share should we have space for uh, questions i'll be very happy to take questions otherwise i'll be staying with you till the end of the talk so that we can uh, take questions at the end over to the moderators do we have any moderator here or shall we ask dr vijay shetty the next speaker to take over this talk on how you pull prp in treating opd in treating opd patients dr vijay shetty are you there yes can you hear me yes we can very clearly hear you good evening dr prakash all pleasure to introduce dr vijay shetty who is going to illuminate us over the next 15 minutes on how prp is useful in treating outpatients over to dr vijay shetty please switch on your video start sharing your screen and start speaking to us dr vijay shetty thank you very much indeed uh, dr prakash nice speaking to you again uh, let me just um, uh, share the screen i think you will have to come out uh, okay can you see see my screen hello hello Hello. Yes, Vijay, we can see your screen. Please Thank go you ahead. very much. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, just one second. You may have to put it in full screen mode, and then. Yeah, yeah. I'll do that in a minute. <coughs>
Can you see now? Hello? Yes, we can see now. We can see now. We can oh, see now. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Clear, thank very you. clear. Very clear. All right. Okay. So, uh, they, uh, Dr. Karne actually spoke to me uh, uh, just a couple of days ago. So, uh, you know, I there is a small change in my uh, title. Um, what I thought I should deal with you uh, is that uh, this is a new kid in town uh, of, uh, you know, treating uh, the osteoarthritis of the knee um, where, uh, you know, there are some situations where we have uh, good, uh, uh, you know, information about treatment. And there are some cases where we don't know uh, how to proceed. And, and this is the, going to be my topic today, dealing with the unknown. Uh, that's the disclaimer and my disclosures there. And uh, uh, I think uh, this is a very important thing. Since we are actually going to talk about office orthopedics today, uh, I think uh, we need to be talking about uh, the stage one and two osteoarthritis, uh, uh, which are uh, usually uh, handled uh, uh, in uh, in an OPD setup. Now, this is these are some facts about uh, osteoarthritis. Over fifty percent of the population have arthritis. This is uh, from uh, BMJ two thousand four. Fifty uh, percent of uh, the population have arthritis in one or more joints. So we uh, we are. 1.3 billion people. So I think almost uh, uh, half of the population in our country have arthritis in some form. Uh, and I think in our country, it's women who are disproportionately affected by arthritis. Uh, the, uh, the young generation, when I'm talking about the uh, arthritis in stage one and stage two, uh, it's, it's very, very important that it affect, we, need, we need to know that it affects people when they are in the best of their ability to perform. They are earning good, they are contributing to the society, family and everything, and suddenly arthritis strikes. So this is one of those uh, good old classification. I think on, on your extreme left is grade one, extreme right is grade four in, in uh, 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 progression. Now, obviously we are not going to talk about grade four here. Maybe we touch on grade three, but grade one and two are the ones which uh, are a problem. Now, this is a, a, a treatment spectrum that I created for myself uh, to make patients understand in the OPD. Uh, when the people come in, you know, usually some of them, as Dr. Prakash mentioned, that uh, it could be, uh, you know, third opinion or fourth opinion. They come in and, and talk to you. It's quite useful to take them through. Obviously, we can't avoid arthritis. Uh, it has to some way, uh, you know, strike us at some point, but uh, we can deal with them. So uh, if you take your patient, first of all, take them into confidence and take them through uh, this uh, spectrum, which I, I strongly recommend for uh, especially young orthopedic surgeons. Um, so wh wh what I do is I just tell them, look, uh, this is where you are, stage one and two or maybe just trying to touch stage, stage three. And these are the options. I mean, broadly, uh, we start with uh, medications. And uh, I don't mind, uh, you know, if some patients come and tell me that, uh, Doc, I, I, I'm trying this Ayurvedic or homeopathic medicine. As long as there is no harm, I don't mind because sometimes it, you know, they, they feel good just by trying these medications. And obviously, at the end of the spectrum, you when it's stage four, you have... Uh, uh, other options. So, you know, Dr. Prakash quite nicely touched on uh, the diclofenac and the injection combination, which is which I think is a very, very important information from that lecture, because we know that uh, we can give number of medications for our patients, but we have to be aware of the problems. Now, if you see uh, this, uh, this slide, uh, uh, you, you see at the end of the uh, the, the last line, which is a painkiller, naproxen, and in red, uh, that's a problem with these drugs. And if you see top left, uh, you know, even if you're doing anything like glucosamine and, and chondroitin sulfase uh, in, in stage one and two, they're still uh, safe compared to the medication. In other words, um, you know, as far as possible, I think we should try and uh, avoid uh, harmful drugs for arthritis. Then if you really look at uh, the medications and 
complications, renal complications for a start, I think, which is, which is a grave uh, problem in our country. And if you really look at the, uh, the slide, uh, in the midline and anything on the right is bad, anything on the left is okay. So I think looking at uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen are bad for uh, the kidneys. And, uh, and again, I think we're all aware, this is one of those very, very common problems uh, with uh, uh, arthritis medications, cardiovascular complications, again, um, silicoxibs and acetaminophen, they're bad for the uh, heart as well. Uh, this is just to highlight that, uh, you know, doing uh, any of these medications on the long run is not a good idea at all, in especially stage one and two. So alternative medicines, we come to the, the, the next step in the spectrum is I don't mind if my patients are coming and telling me I'm doing aromatherapy, reflexology and, and other bits, but I'm happy doc. So I think I just tell them, look, carry out, no problem. As long as it has not made any uh, big, uh, you know, cost any problem to them. I think this is where we are. And this is the topic for today's topic. Uh, where we are, are actually discussing about the injections. Now, I know in the late 90s and to, uh, early 2000s, uh, there was a lot of debate about use of corticosteroids uh, for the knee joint, and, uh, uh, and uh, there were uh, uh, medical legal issues and so many things. Now, when we're talking about injections, especially in stage one and two, and occasionally in stage three, we have three major options. There are other injection options as well, uh, but I think the major ones are corticosteroids, uh, visco supplementation, which is, in other words, in layman's terms, it's called a gel injection, and uh, and the new kid in town, the platelet-rich plasma, which I'm going to touch on. Now, <clears throat> there was this article just about two years ago in in one of the major uh, evidence-based resources in in orthopedics, ortho evidence. There was a beautiful article on using corticosteroids and. If you really look at uh, uh, this option, in my practice, uh, I don't mind using uh, steroid, when, especially when it's an acute scenario. Uh, you know, when somebody comes with so much pain uh, to your clinic and limping and, and not even able to wait bear, and the X-ray shows just the, um, uh, you know, normal uh, bones, but arthritis, I just uh, do the injection without any hesitation. and. Uh, uh, this evidence is, I think, uh, is, is uh, really uh, forthcoming. And if you are looking at the um, side effects of the medications which you would otherwise use in these patients, uh, I think this is probably the best option, especially in acute scenarios. Um, I, I think most people uh, now agree that arthroscopic debridement, which about 10, 15 years ago was an option for Osteoarthritis now almost out of the orthopedic armamentarium uh, this day and age. Visco supplementation, which is otherwise called as a gel injection, I think we have to be aware there is good evidence coming out uh, of the results of visco evidence, uh, visco uh, supplementation. Uh, what it does is it replaces the. This is a very different mechanism of action, uh, replacing or supplementing. Hyaluronic acid, and it, it is meant to restore the lubrication of the joint uh, and uh, that way uh, helping for good uh, uh, mobility. Now, there is something about the visco supplementation which I really want to touch on. The molecular weight of the, uh, the drug or the visco supplementation product that you use is, uh, is very, very important. Um, and there is uh, uh, this big article which came up uh, some years ago saying the hyaluronic acid product with high molecular weight um, uh, is, uh, is supposed to be uh, far superior and has more efficacy uh, compared to other uh, forms of visco supplementation. Now, this is one of those slides which I wanted to uh, highlight this uh, where uh, you, you need about uh, um, 6 million Daltons to produce uh, uh, the effect of visco supplementation. Now, where we should not do visco supplementation, I think that's very important because I think the last decade, just before PRP became very popular, uh, the visco supplementation was one of those uh, office um, orthopedic uh, options for the patients 
Now, where we, these are the areas, these are the patients where we should not do uh, visco supplementation, especially when you have an obese patient and when it's grade three or four, and when there is severe involvement of anterior compartment, uh, and if there is an effusion. In fact, I had a patient last week uh, who came with severe effusion, was offered visco supplementation. Uh, I, I said no, I didn't give him the uh, visco supplementation. And when there is a gross instability of the joint, visco supplementation doesn't help. And also when there is a, a major malalignment. Now again, uh, about four years ago, this was one major uh, publication that appeared in Auto Evidence, uh, where uh, the uh, different uh, treatment arms were uh, compared uh, to uh, platelet rich plasma, which is now becoming very, very popular in uh, uh, osteoarthritis and, and in office orthopedic uh, options. Uh, now, this, this is one paper where uh, uh, Dr. Mohit Bandari's team in Canada actually uh, did a, a level one study and they compared PRP to placebo, non-operative treatment, steroid, hyaluronic acid, and surgery alone. And in most cases, uh, PRP did uh, very well. Even um, uh, in uh, with when it compared to, it was compared to hyaluronic acid or uh, uh, visco supplementation. So today we have good level one, high quality, evidence on the use of PRP in osteoarthritis, especially for the stage one and two. Now, when I was uh, asked to talk about uh, PRP, uh, Dr. Ker Ker Kerne uh, actually asked me to touch on PRP. Now, I think uh, these are the two most common conditions in orthopedics, which have the best high quality evidence on the use of PRP in OA. One is tennis elbow and the other one is uh, the early osteoarthritis. I'm not going to touch too much on this one, but when, if it comes to uh, surgical options, it's not just the uh, joint replacement. There are osteotomies, partial arthrotomy, arthroplasty, and total um, joint replacement. Now, most of the time, surgery for severe knee osteoarthritis is uh, total knee replacement. And this is one thing which I... Uh, wanted to share with you, this is definitely not office orthopedics. The picture that or video you're seeing on your left is definitely not office osteoarthritis treatment. And these people only do well with uh, surgery. This is my opinion. I thank you very much for your attention, uh, for coming on line on a, on a Sunday. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Independence Day. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Shetty, for the wonderful talk. This is Dr. Abhijit Kale. Hi, hi, Abhijit. Yeah. Yeah. I have one question for you. Yeah, your talk was very elaborative. Yeah, can you further highlight on the cost benefit analysis of using platelet rich plasma on OPD basis? Uh, Vijay, uh, it depends on what system you use. Now, there, there are so many uh, areas uh, of PRP use that I have not touched, Abhijit. One of them is uh, the, the preparation type, you know, the PRP. Um, uh, the PRP that we knew about 10 years ago was different, and the PRP that we know now is different. Uh, and uh, there are a number of studies, uh, uh, you know, um, talking about the um, leukocyte rich or poor. For me, there are two important uh, solutions. One is a leukocyte rich PRP. The other one is leukocyte poor PRP. Now, uh, for joints, when it comes to joints, whether it's knee or or any other joint, it has to be leukocyte poor PRP because we don't want to put pump too much too too much of WBCs into the joint because they will incite the inflammation and and, and sometimes um, it can cause more pain because of synovitis. Uh, so when it comes to the joints, it is leukocyte uh, poor PRP. And when it comes to tendons, for example, if it's tennis elbow, then it, it has to be leukocyte uh, uh, rich PRP. So we have uh, 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 you know different kits which, in fact, uh, uh, prepare the type of solution that you want. In fact, some of the kits now that I use come with a filter. Um, this two days back, I did uh, 
uh, PRP into four knees and, and they came up with a filter which is supposed to filter the leukocytes out of that solution. So that is one thing. The answer to your question is I, I have no idea. But uh, in Mumbai, uh, 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 a PRP injection into a uh, joint will cost roughly about 25 to 30,000. And if it's a PRP into a uh, uh, tennis elbow, for example, uh, it costs roughly around 20,000. I have not actually, uh, I mean, we, we inform this to the patients and, and all that. And if you're doing a, a, hyalur a hyaluronic acid, high uh, molecular weight uh, uh, visco supplementation, that also costs roughly around the same. Now, if you uh, look at the evidence, um, I think uh, uh, th there are more papers coming out on uh, the use of PRP in the knee and with good effects. I hope I, I try to answer your question. Yeah. One small question, Dr. Shetty. Yeah. So, yeah. How thank much you, does the PRP you. machine cost? Uh, our PRP machine, right, right now I'm using the one from uh, Tricel, which is uh, which, uh, Tricel from Chennai. Which uh, you know, in the if I am using in the hospital where I am injecting, they have their own way of buying these uh, machines, and they I think they charge uh, MRP. But I, I, I if I am using it in my private setup, it is much less. I think it's roughly around sixteen thousand in the hospital. If any, Thank you. Any of the viewers want to buy a PRP machine for their own, hmm. an Indian machine, what should be their estimated budget? Uh, Dr. Prakash, actually, some years ago, it was different. It was in lakhs. Now, there, there are portable machines. And the one that I have, in fact, if you're doing good numbers, uh, they, they provide these machines for that particular case. But if you are doing in big, very, very big numbers, you can buy a machine for about 45 to 50,000. Very Below portable. 50, Below 50,000. 50, yes, yes. Excellent. Yeah. Wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much. Dr. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Vijay Shetty, sir, will you please stop sharing your screen? Oh, yes. And, sorry. Yeah. May I ask the next speaker, Dr. Arvind Divet Divakar, to share his screen? And he's going to speak on the use of needle technique in managing fractures of the small joints of the hand and feet. And by the time Dr. Divakar starts sharing his screen, I have one quick question for Dr. L. Prakash, sir. Yes, Dr. Ready. Prakash, sir. Yeah, for the junior doctors who will be starting with the sodium channel blocks, which would be the ideal case and which would be the ideal site for injection? One commonest site and with a good result, so that they with the positive result they will start uh, even the other uh, etiologists. First thing to try is alpha one, which is the first web space for all shoulder issues. Next time we get a periarthritis shoulder, supraspinous uh, tendinitis, subscapular issues, dislocated shoulder, any issue, give one alpha one, wait for 20 minutes and see the magic. Next is beta six, which is in the groin, three finger breaths lateral to the femoral artery pulsation. And that gives dramatic pain relief in neck of femurs and trochanteric fractures. When you are shifting a patient of trochanteric fracture for x-ray, you can see a dramatic difference in the patient's pain relief. And the last is acute sciatica with SLR of 10 to 15 degrees, beta 1, 2, and 3. So as the talk is being recorded, the spots and the durations and descriptions are all clear in the talk itself. Otherwise, you can send me a WhatsApp message. And this is an open message to everybody who is listening to the talk. I can be sending you a PDF containing all the blocks, spots, and the composition. So for a beginner, alpha 1, beta 1, 2, and 3, and beta 6 are sure shot blocks, which will produce such a dramatic smile on a patient's face that you will be sold on the system. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Arvind Divakar, with you, can you please start sharing your screen? By the time you share your screen, probably we can take one more question with Dr. Prakash, sir. Dr. Prakash, sir, in which condition is a strict no-no for a sodium channel block? Strict no-no. Which condition is a no-no? Yeah, to a contraindication to go for a sodium no, no, channel we, block. Technically, pregnant woman, malignancies, we have given them in every condition. In diabetics, we do not use steroid. 
and the only condition and if you are using a xylo card where there is no known allergy then there is technically no contraindication for sodium channel blocks but the conventional xylo cane comes with a preservative which has got a very small percentage of patients like 0.5 percent who are anaphylactic to the preservative of lidocaine or xylocaine so when you are using xylocaine xylocaine sensitivity is the contraindication if you are using xylocard and meaning to discard the ampule after every injection i haven't found any contraindication and let dr divakar start his talk by answering his question answering this particular question because he has been one of the inventors of this procedure dr divakar over dr divakar thank you so much dr prakash i thank you all to ha have this session of office orthopedics <clears throat> this is the future of orthopedics incorporated in iua i thank dr karne dr shinde dr shiv shankar those who has given support to this sort of platform and now we shall share the future of the orthopedics so first now the side effects of xylocaine the question asked <clears throat> only 2 years back the xylocaine manufacturer have added something which gave <clears throat> sympathetic shock to the patient and i have reported one every week and i was worried about it that what happened but uh, for last one year the xylocaine which is coming it is free of the side effects i don't know what they had two years back or the corona made some difference that with corona it is unsafe it gives shock that i can conclude so any other question we will ask uh, answer later so now let us start with the micro yeah so you may start with yes, the micro invasive evolution i am clear in my voice am i clear yeah also you your voice is very much clear can we can also see your yes, voice is very clear please go ahead okay okay okay, okay. clear voice okay so what micro invasive means first we have mini invasive we do some incision in micro we do not damage any of the tissue so we have some devices and the device is known as intramuscular needle 24g you must have seen so many injection but you have never seen <clears throat> any scar sort of thing with a needle so i concluded it is a micro invasive and this is a evolution which has taken 30 40 years in that so now needle length what we are using in india is a hypodermic needle and we think it is a intramuscular needle no it is only a hypodermic needle intramuscular needle is very very long you can see intramuscular needle come 7 by 8 inches to 1 and 1/2 inches but what we are using it only 5 by 8 or, or, or 6 by 8 so but because indians are thin we have less fat so hypodermic needle being used as intramuscular needle no problem but in any case you have fatty persons you try to buy intramuscular needle itself so the thing <clears throat> just i read few years back in camp charles that percutaneous spinning by kapanji what he has used intrafocal means he enters through the fracture site itself and it acts as a buttress against displacement and good results in literature but why it is not so popular the reason being it is an invasive procedure kevar are thick they produce a skin scar and they produce some displacement on the fracture site this was the technique he has used he used in manipulation with a syringe and needle and he manipulated fracture and coax rather like a joystick and fix the k wire right in that way so we insert needle in same way as hematoma block this is intrafocal wire of kapanji you can see the process of hematoma block through the fracture site 
and I have transformed this with my microinvasive because K wire is mini invasive. Microinvasive because it doesn't produce any scar or any lesion, and even if you pierce the tendon, it doesn't produce any damage. You can insert the needle through the fracture, and a hair induction do not displace with the size of needle. The two reasons: number one, needle is collapsible and compressible, and it is already very thin. And third thing, so sharp that it can enter from any point. So trillions of intramuscular injection have been given globally. Skin scars never seen by 24G needle. Impalement of nerve and artery unheard till now. Only venous blood penetration. Sometimes you penetrate a vein and you get a blood inside. So you have to suck it back and see whether it is inside vein or not. Safe to traverse skin, fascia, muscle, physis, and epiphysis. This is very important for the orthopedician to by which we can traverse physis and epiphysis safely. You can cut a needle at hub like this. Cut hub is hub means the plastic plastic thing which fits in the syringe. You can cut from the hub and leave this wide bead so it makes a small olive wire. It can be bent to make a no snare staple that I'll show you later on how it is bent to make a staple. Used as a pad to fix, cut or amputated distal phalanx. For distal phalanx amputation, no microsurgery is needed. You simply insert this needle. Available at every corner of the globe, sterilized and unlimited amount. This is the beauty that you can ask in any small blaze, you get this instrument. And the driver, that means the syringe is the driver. You get both freely available all over the world. And sharp enough to pierce thick skin or the nail bag. You can push the needle through the nail bag. It goes easily. Otherwise, if you try to suture nail with a, a cutting needle, it is very difficult. And sometimes if you try to suture with the heel skin, it is very tough to penetrate, but our needle penetrates very well. Intrafocal pinning holds reduction very well, allows motion, no splint, no rest. This is the best thing because it doesn't traverse the joint. The thing is inside shaft. If you use k -bar, it is never inside shaft. It has to traverse at least one joint. So you see this case, the fracture here in two and the needle inserted like this and then cut like olive. So it looks very good like Miros. Previously, I used whole syringes. And the syringes look very bad. Patient used to say, oh, what, what I have done? Why did you put this needle? But this looks like some implement or instrumentation. <clears throat> Phalanx fracture are best suitable for needle fixation. You can see here the case and after fixation. Until I read about Kapandi method, I was using the same method as a subperiosteal needle fixation. The moment I read about Kapanji, I thought this method looks better and it is better. Although I can supplement intrafocal needle with a superior steel as well. And you see, person, the fracture and needle fixation. And the, because the needle tend to exclude out with the movement in bed or something like sleeping or bathing. So I cover them either with a thin layer of plaster or elastic plaster or anything. Foot also behaves nice to the needle. See this case of a child, massive edema. And then I try to reduce first, and x ray is not very well reduced. Then after reduction, I inserted a few more needles. And see, after removal, 50 days, the good union is there. You can see the callus. And the beauty is the patient was walking in the Plaster boot. He was advised not to put too much pressure on the toe, but he was working on the heel. So he was working from the day one. Fracture is very well maintained and very well united without side effect. And what was the cost to me? Only two rupees for the needle. Dislocation of IP is the best candidate for microinvasion because you are going to traverse the joint and tendon also. So K-wire is inept. 
you can fix with a subperiosteal needle one or two needles and allow full motion remove after 10 days for this location 10 days is sufficient this patient last august you can see this fracture and after insertion of needle and a envelope of thin gypsona hand is free during healing phase it is totally free like he can do anything this is 3 weeks old dislocation came to me dip i have reduced it put the needle i have put needle through the joint itself so the needle acts as a pack and it doesn't allow motion of the phalanx of the joint and you see she is moving fairly good Something has happened. I have to restart. Yeah, sir. We can't see your PPT now. No, no. It just me stop now. I'm. Yes, sir. So by the time you are able to share your PPT yes. with K wire, yes, we have a manman or any drilling system by which we can drill across the bone. How do you manage to pierce the cortex with the help of the needle? No, no. There is no need to pierce the cortex. You go through the fracture gap itself. There is no need. Simply, you have so to. So, are enter. there any contraindications to using this technique? There is no contraindication. It has been used very well in all cases. What Ashwin Jawakar needs to say is the syringe acts as a plunger and a driver. Use a ten ml syringe with a needle and hold the ten ml syringe in your hand. That will give you a very good control. You can see it under the arm. You can slightly shift it, bend it. And you can uh, pass over. I have used this in number of cases, and I found it far superior to power driven or even manually driven mirror things. You just lock the lower lock to a syringe and gently manipulate and push, 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 push. It goes good, good. Needles are really sharp, sterile, always available, and for especially small bones, it is like wonderful and magic. Uh, I could understand Dr. Jawakar's problem was he was trying. He had put a whole big slide with so many stills and a video, and when he started playing the video, it froze. So keep going forward, keep going forward. Don't play this video. Don't play okay. the video. Okay. Okay. Now. Just we will agree that moments are there. Now you can go yes. next. The Mukesh case came with a body strapping. Some local doctor have given a body strapping, as it has been taught to us that you can simply do body strapping and it will work. in the strapping it was totally displaced i told him that what you want you want kevar or you want mini invasive uh, then he said he'll come few days later and he come five days later so then the, you can see in the strap given by the doctor is still the displacement is there five days later he gets x-ray done in strapping and i have shown him it is not it is not replaced so i did this just before final inserted one needle then more needle covered with the plaster this is the plaster is is much better cover a thin layer of gypsona over a simple bandage it makes a better cover it saves the needle from the extrusion and you can see on day 3 the person is working only on single nobody is strapping and when i have removed at 6 weeks i have found that if needle removed for 6 weeks into phalanx it gives re displacement so please do not remove the needle for 6 weeks or preferably even 8 weeks because the patient is moving he has no problem you can see good union and almost you cannot see and the motion is very well maintained now it is without So by the time you are again able to share the screen, do you ever have had a secondary migration of this needle? 
needless migrated until I have uh, put them a cover. Needles have been migrating. Can you enumerate more on that thin layer of gypsona that you put around it? Yes, you simply give a, a simple bandage and give a thin layer of gypsona around it. Yes, this is the problem. Some video is not playing. Dr. Devaka, you have a small issue with your PowerPoint which is not updated to the latest version. So, all videos, every time you are trying to play a video, it is hanging. No, so, no, I am not going to play. Even if video was not ah, played. So you are accepting that game. your video functions are good and do not play videos. Just no, no, I am not playing. Even without playing, it, it, it was hanging. So, now okay. there is no more video now. Okay. Now, with no more videos. It won't hang. So, it will it won't hang. For children's one to four Salta Harris injury, it is unmatched and safe fixation. Because people are may be happy with the K-wire, but I am not happy. I wanted micro-invasion. And the micro-invasion beauty is you don't need anything. You need no OT, no anesthesia. You can fix under CR or X-ray machine. And that too quickly. So this was the patient. The X-ray he brought was poor. And the quack gave him this sort of bandage, a splint. I took him to the OT. First, I insert a needle just to see whether I am in the right place. Then, after reduction, I insert the needle fully. You can see the interim reduction and the final reduction. And immediately after plaster ablation, you can see the plaster over the arm. That plaster is recently applied because hematoma block is given. There is no pain. And he is allowed to work. He can go to school even. And he comes after a few days, although I do not paste it photograph here. And for colysis fracture, Barton fracture, and especially Smith fracture, this needle is very, very good. For colysis, it may not be good. Why? Because of the dorsal comminution, it doesn't act as good as and without comminution. But in Smith, we never have comminution. So it is very well fixed. So this is one colysis fracture you can see here. Needles have been inserted. And the plaster applied because needle do not hold. But needle stop redisplacement during the plaster, which will always displace if the plaster gets loose. So here with this plaster and the needle, even if it gets loose, it doesn't displace. This plaster has been opened recently. She has just gone home happily. And the case, colisive fracture, needle put, and the plaster given. And the unending saga continues. Why needle work better than K wire? Easy availability. Readjustment done anytime in OPD whenever needed. Unlike K wire, you have to go to OT and ask for the anesthesia. But needle can be readjusted in the OPD itself. As I told, it is non traumatic, almost zero traumatic. No need of operation theater or aesthetist. Never breaks. Many doctors have asked. What happens if needle breaks? It has never broke. Never. Never in fact. Full motion allowed. Stiffness is minimal. Easy to remove. Patient can remove even himself. And long record of success. Long record means 40 years. And what I have to say at IOS or the office orthopedics, we work in reverse. We try to make Molels out of the mountains rather. You treat same thing with the mountain, I can treat with the molehill. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. And Dr. Karne for giving me this chance to explain my new technology. Thank you, Dr. Divakar, sir. It was indeed a wonderful talk. So another question for you. Are there any references in the literature where this technique has been used? The other references other. are references are Kapandi technique. It's the reference, and I just changed Kapandi technique with this intramuscular needle. I see, sir. I see. Fine. 
fine so what would be a ideal case for the new generation orthopod to start adapting your technique yes if it is hand or foot fractures nothing can replace it in future nothing will find you will find better thing than this number 2 for all intrafibular fractures this is the best fixation naturally this alone works only in the hand injuries in foot in colitis in physis you need a plaster slab if it is a children's physis you need plaster slab for 2 weeks or 3 weeks only but it is used as a sole fixation for the hand fractures 6 to 8 weeks should be must in foot fracture i keep it for only for 4 uh, to 6 weeks but in hand i prefer 6 to 8 weeks 6 weeks so can you again come out with the needle number that you use i use Your only one needle that is 24g no other needle okay. neither 23 nor 26 because if a 26 needle you it doesn't give good fixation and length is very small if you use thicker needle the fracture may displace so naturally you can think that kvr is much much thicker than any needle so thank you thank you thank you for the wonderful talk uh dr prakash sir do you have any comment for dr divakar no i have an input which i want to add to dr divakar's talk the thinnest k wire available with us is 1.2 mm which is as thick as an 18 gauge needle 1 mm k wires are very pliable and they don't actually work 24 gauge needle is 0.9 mm but it is heat hardened steel 410 unlike the 316l which is used for the kvs so obviously we do not want the injection needles to bend during injecting and that is why despite being hollow they are hardened and needles are manufactured by a special process in which a hollow big rod is stretched and drawn and drawn and drawn and the diameter is reduced so the needle will have a much much more linear and axial stiffness and penetrative power than an equivalent k wire of the same diameter so what dr divakar has found out is rather revolutionary that he has converted a mini invasive thing called a k wire fixation into a micro invasive thing called a needle fixation my only worry in the initial stages was about the tissue reaction to the metal because a needle is at one use transient device it need not necessarily have been bio compatible like 316l and it could be made out of 410 stainless steel which might rust but dr divakar has tried it in few hundred cases and the needles come out as polished as they were when they went in in a similar manner i have done only half a dozen cases maximum 10 cases and i have found no troubles with needles and we are lucky that 24 gauge needle costs just 1 rupee it's available in sarai available in every corner shop in every medical shop and can be procured at 5 minutes notice for any emergency and can be used in a large variety of conditions including reimplantation of digits soft tissue injuries patellar fractures we are writing a whole chapter on the magic of needle which shall be published eventually and i shall share the links to all people so my Dr. prakash yeah. i have seen rusting of the intramuscular needle and very interestingly mm -hmm. the needle had been broken and was left inside for 24 years when i removed it it was rusted so it should take at least 10 or 15 years to rust <laughs> <laughs> i removed one needle from the finger okay it was actually incorporated into a tendon lumbrical tendon uh -huh. and the surgeon who tried to remove it he opened all corner of the hand and he could not find needle then he sent to me with the open hand open uh -huh. incision then i took him to the crm and i moved every structure i found the needle was fitted in the lumbrical tendon and i had taken out it was rusted 
So technically it so, means for so it was only after 24 years I have seen the needle rust. Ah, so for six weeks the needle doesn't rust. No, I, I don't think it will rust in within five years. <laughs> five years. <laughs> so uh, that uh, Dr. Abhijit, the question is uh, answer is uh, which was worrying us has been cleared that hypodermic needles use a temporary fixation devices till the union of fractures will not rust and can be repositioned as implants. And it will never break. It will never break. Because it is heat hardened, it is stiff. So unlike K wires, which are malleable and breakable, these won't break. So one for the final question. Uh, K wire, which is made up of 3161L, is yes. approved for uh, in vivo use. Yes. Whether any medical legal issue may arise for use of needle which has not been approved for in vivo use. In vivo, we are using intramuscular syringe. It is used for the intra in, in vivo use. All so the injection can, after after in vivo. Yeah, so it is used, but then it is removed. It is not placed inside. Here we are keeping inside. For no, this much, this I will agree with treatment. Dr. Abhiji. That currently, if any complication happens because of needle remaining in for three to four weeks, because of this unconventional and unorthodox method, and the patient wants to sue you in the court of the law, you may not have a very strong wicket to stand on. So to avoid this, we have to take a special consent from the patient that because I do not want to afford anesthesia and theater, I am subjecting myself to an alternative method of using hypodermic needles which has been proven safe by the surgeon in his hands and I am willing to take the risk. Okay, fine. Like even yeah. for floating channel blocks, we have special consent and Dr. Karne, I think, should be having a talk during the next Sunday or Sunday after that in detail about the medical legal aspects in office orthopedics and consent forms and how to take consents and what are the different consents. His talk will be a 45 minute to one hour talk. We were just discussing. And in that, he will tell that we are now moving towards litigative times where consent is more important than the surgery. And the language of consent is still more important. So we should be able to take proper consents for all sorts of procedures. So, sir, that's a very important disclaimer that you have highlighted. So, thank you for that valuable input. As we are running short of time, uh, on the behalf of West Zone Indian Orthopedic Association and along, along with my team, Dr. Ashish Nis, who is the co-moderator, -co and Dr. Ashok Ghodke, I thank you all for joining today's webinar on uh, office orthopedics and giving your valuable input to make it highly successful. Again, on the behalf of West Zone Indian Orthopedic Association, I thank you, everyone, and hope to see you next Sunday at the same time, that's 5.30 p.m. onwards. Thank you, Dr. L. Prakash and Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Abhijit. Thank you for making it successful. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Abhijit. And I must thank, yeah. very special thanks to Neeraj Vigilani, Ajok Shyam, whom you have forgotten to mention, yeah, yeah, who have been yeah. doing all the IT yeah. works for this. Yeah. So yeah. my yeah. very special thanks to yeah. both yeah. Neeraj Vigilani and Ajok yeah. Shyam yeah. for making this Bas. event a wonderful yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Team Auto TV. And now you can stop right going please. live. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And wish you a uh, happy Independence Day. Yeah. And may the light of the freedom spread across. Thank you. Good night. Now you can.